So because it's the holiday season, we've been doing some cool kind of different content with all of this. And uh, some of the videos have been very short, others have been a little bit long. And for this one, I thought, you know, it's been a while since we've done a fun deep dive and I wanted to do one. And in a completely unrelated note, I also wanted to show you my Smoky Glow merch. Because it's Glomus and I love Glomus so very much. One of the channels I follow is called Smoky Glow and she does commentary and makeup and all the awesome things and she's just a delight. And I got to, you know, pick up one of her sweatshirts for Glomus this year and I hadn't worn it yet. So now I'm doing so. Go check out Smoky Glow. She's amazing. We're not talking about makeup or all things smoky. We're talking about all things bubbly today. And I will tell you more about that in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 204 of 365 days of soap, and today we are doing the Great Bubble Chase Deep Dive. Now, what does that mean? A few months ago, I put out on the community tab for the YouTube video things what sorts of questions you guys had so I could do an FAQ, and that FAQ actually ended up being me able to address two questions, really. But one of the questions that came up was uh, how to formulate a recipe to get a big, beautiful, awesome bubble, right? Because there are a number of ways that you can do that. And so I thought, this is actually a question that deserves its own deep dive in and of itself because there's, again, a lot of ways that you can do that to get that big, excellent bubble. So that's what we are going to do today. We're going to do a deep dive on all things big bubble in a soap, why we care about the lather and what you can do both within the base oils but also in additives if you really don't want to use the proper base oils to increase that lather and ensure that your end user is uh, super happy all of the time. So, you know, let's get to that. Okay, so first up, I think what we should really talk about is why we even care about a big, beautiful lather. And the most obvious reason is because your end user cares about the big, beautiful lather. Customers are weird. They have a very interesting and unique perspective as to how they approach, you know, their shopping and whether or not they deem a product good. Because while you as the soap maker and or the chemist might know that this bar is amazing because of X, Y, and Z oils or additives or whatever you put into it, they don't really care. Granted, that's not every customer. Some consumers super care. If you're running in the vegan crowd, for example, yeah, they super wanna know that you have not harmed an animal in the making of this product. If you're rolling with, you know, people with allergies, yeah, they super wanna know what goes into the, you know, actual products so they don't have an allergic reaction. People with sensitive skin, that's kind of the same thing. Um, but here's the thing, most people are not vegan or have allergic reactions. Most people do not. So for the most part, your standard user is going to really look at two or three big things when deciding to buy and use a bar of soap. And looking is actually a really bad, you know, way to put it because soap is all sensory. You see it, you smell it, you feel it. I guess you don't taste it, but you could. Don't lick your soap. But yeah, so the three big things that they're looking for is uh, first and foremost, the scent. Scent sells bars faster than anything else. 
that's just what it is. Second, the design, sure. Um, I have not found that consumers super care about the design though, and we have talked about that a lot. If the soap is too pretty, they're less likely to buy it than just a normal average looking bar of soap. Granted, if your soap looks toe up and there's some clear problems with it, they're not going to be drawn to it, but the design isn't super, super important. Let's assume they have picked the scent and the design that they like and they have purchased this bar and now they're at home in their shower or at their sink and they are ready to use this soap. The biggest way a customer is going to determine that it's a good bar of soap is how quickly it lathers. And think about that, like when you are in random, you know, bathrooms out in the world, you know, in the publics, and you go to wash your hands with whatever stuff they have, and it doesn't lather, I automatically assume, well, this is shitty soap. And I assume that as a soap maker that understands the chemistry of all the fatty acids. So it's not necessarily the case. Also, lather isn't necessarily what gets you clean. We know that as soap makers, the end user probably knows that if they thought enough to logic it out, but their brain is still going to go to good lather equals cleansing. Like it's actually, it's cleaning me. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And then obviously with the rest of it, with the drying and whatever, cheap soap is notoriously awful for the drying of the hands and the skin and all of the things. But the first thing they're going to look for is that big, awesome bubble. So that's the reason why the great bubble chase is so important. Because if you're not going to get a repeat customer because your lather is scant, it's probably best to do what you can to increase that lather so they don't have those problems at all. And they want to come back and continue purchasing your very awesome skin loving soaps. So what is the best way to get a big, beautiful, awesome lather? Well, first let's talk about how to formulate that using just your base oils. In order to talk about the best way to formulate a recipe with a great, big, beautiful, epic bubble, we have to go back to the fatty acid profiles because that's where all soap is actually created. It's within the fatty acid chains. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna do a quick rundown of what all these fatty acids are and help you remember you know, what they all do. So first up, we have oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acids. And those are all going to be your moisturizing and conditioning acids. These, again, very moisturizing, creamy lather, but a very, very scant lather. That is not going to cause your bubble. And so the oils that we are looking at that are high in your oleic, your linoleic, and your linolenic acids are going to be things like palm oil, rice bran oil, olive oil, sunflower oil, but we will be talking about sunflower oil in relation to a good bubble in a minute. Almond oil, apricot oil, hemp seed oil, a lot of the lightweight carrier oils really are going to be very high in your moisturizing fatty acids and not very high in anything else. And then we have the palmitic acid, which as we know, really contributes to bar hardening and produces a nice creamy lather and can stabilize lather to a point. Not as much though as the racinoleic acid, which is really only found in castor oil. That's why castor oil is such a unique, cool oil to include in a number of recipes and a big bubble recipe is definitely one that you should consider including racinoleic acids, castor oil in. But racinoleic, if used in too high of, of amounts, can actually bring that lather down. So instead of boosting it. So we also pay attention to that. And then we have the stearic acid, which again, helps with bar hardening, also leads to a very creamy lather as far as just looking at lather properties of all these oils and their, their fatty acid chains, right? So as I said, racinoleic is found in castor and that's basically it. Palmitic acid is found in palm and tallow and lard and also in rice bran oil. A couple of the uh, more liquid oils, neem, pretty sure. Neem smells so bad. And your stearic acid is going to be found in palm oil, but it's also going to be found in all of the butters. So the mangoes, the shays, the cocoa butters, those sorts of things. So really the only two other fatty acid profiles that we're looking at with uh, soaps is uh, lauric acid and muristic acid. Now both of these fatty acid chains really contribute to a big, beautiful bubble, huge bubbles. Awesome. Immediately you have an immediate lather payoff as soon as you wet it and just roll it over a couple times in your hand, big, amazing, awesome bubbles. So the lauric acid and the muristic acid, first and foremost, when you're formulating a soap recipe, you're definitely going to want a reasonably high percentage of both of those acid chains 
in your soap recipes. Now, muristic and lauric acid most commonly found in coconut oil, babassu oil, uh, palm kernel oil. So really that's kind of what we're working with. The first thing, if you want to increase your big bubble in any recipe, is to look at those three oils. Now, babassu, pretty expensive oil, but it's a pretty good substitution for coconut just across the board. I actually use babassu as a substitution for palm oil in my palm-free recipes for different reasons, but we're not talking about those reasons today. We're talking about what it does as far as the lather is concerned. And palm kernel oil, well, that's a reasonably cheap oil, and so is coconut. So both of those oils should be in your recipes between, I don't know, 20 and 50%. That is what I would recommend for those oils. But what I'm saying is your lauric acid and your myristic acids reasonably should be for your base oils for an easy way to get a really good big bubble should be between 20 and 50% of your total batch. When we're looking at things like a big bubble blend, and I've done a big bubble blend on the channel before. I've given you my recipe for my, my big bubblers. One of my favorites is 33% coconut oil, 33% palm oil. So you got the big beautiful lather, plus the stabilizing of the lather and the bar hardening with the palm, 30% olive oil, and the rest of the batch is castor. Now, castor used in that amount, it's actually a really good sweet spot for castor oil if you're looking for that castor oil to really increase and stabilize the lather so it lasts longer. One of the sad things about coconut oil, babassu oil, and palm kernel oil is that while that lather is big right off the bat, it's fleeting. It goes away quickly. And also the bar gets used up faster when you have too high a percentages of any of those oils just because of the way that their fatty acid chain composition is actually structured. For more information about that, I highly suggest going to my coconut oil deep dive where I really get into what all of these fatty acid profiles mean or any of the oil deep dives because I do believe we talk about that in every single one. But yeah, for the most part, if you wanted to make sure that you had a really big, beautiful lather, in any bar of soap, the easiest way to do it is to focus on your base oils. And again, nice guide, anywhere between 20 and 50% of your base oils should be high in your lauric and your myristic acids. And then you're almost guaranteed to get a really great bubble no matter what. Some people don't like using coconut oil though. Some people don't like using babassu. Some people don't like using palm kernel because when you have oils like that with your lauric and your myristic acids in them, it's they do have the tendency, or at least they are claimed to have the tendency of being drying. First and foremost, when you're making handmade soap, um, drying is such a weird thing. I think when people think of soap drying your skin, they're actually thinking of the detergent bars, right? Like the, the doves and the ivories and the, you know, the things that you get for like, you know, a buck at the dollar store the detergent bars, they're send up bars. They're not actually soap. They're not actually legally able to be called soap. And if you look on all of their boxes, they are called something to the effect of a detergent bar or a beauty bar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because they have artificial bubblers that are absolutely stripping your skin. Thing is, when you are working with a soap, like a handcrafted soap, and it's le legally and literally soap. So the fatty acids, your lye solution creates soap, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a bar that's actually drying to your skin. But that said, you know, stranger things have happened. So what do you do to boost your lather if you want to use less coconut oil or babassu or palm kernel and more of a moisturizing oil, but you still wanna make sure that you have that really great, big, beautiful bubble. Well, this is where the additives come in. And I'm not actually talking about like artificial additives using artificial bubblers or anything like that. We are going to talk about ways to boost your lather really great effective ways to boost your lather without using any sort of artificial bubblers. So that's what we are doing next. So let's do that after I take a potty break. Hold please. Okay, I'm back and I feel much better because bathroom. So if you don't want to formulate your recipe using your base oils and paying attention to the fatty acid profiles, or let's say that you really do want to make a Castile soap, for example, a 100% olive oil soap, but you want to avoid the slimy lather that olive oil soaps, Castile soaps tend to have. You still want that big lather payoff. So what do we do? 
Well, that's when additives really come into play. And we actually talked about additives quite a bit yesterday, like weird stuff people put in soap, right? And the one not weird thing that people put in soap that actually has a huge benefit right off the bat is going to be sugar. And sugar comes in the form of almost anything. So we can actually lump in things like beers and purees and, you know, honey and sugar into the sugar category if we're talking about just specifically the lather and how sugar actually increases that lather. So adding sugar to a recipe, to almost any recipe, is going to increase the bubble pretty significantly depending on how you use it just right off the bat. And it's a very easy addition to put into your soaps, which we actually talked about yesterday. There are a couple downsides that I don't think we discussed yesterday with uh, sugar or any of the additives, and that is it can accelerate trace. So you can be working with a thicker batter. So, you know, just keep that in mind if you want to start boosting your lather that way. But we know that sugar does increase the lather, but do we know why? Well, sugar in and of itself, again, whether you are looking at it in a beer or a just regular table sugar or a fruit puree or, you know, whatever, we are looking at a carb. And realistically, what we are looking at within soap and how it boosts lather are the hydroxyl groups that exist in, you know, reasonably most carbs, but for sure within sugar, any sort of sugar additive that we would put into soap. And so we're talking about the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, and that's called a hydroxyl group, okay? And what that means is for a sugar molecule, we have essentially a hydrophobic end, an end that doesn't like water, and a hydrophilic end, an end that loves water. We also have that in soap. We have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends to the composition of our soap molecules as well. So what does that mean? Well, with sugar, there is a bigger hydrophilic end than there is a hydrophobic end. So that means that sugar, and you see this, if you just put some sugar into some water, how quickly it dissolves, it loves water. It's drawn to water. It wants to break apart and be happy with water. A bigger hydrophilic end than a hydrophobic end, the part that's afraid of water. Now, when you look at soap, and that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because soap is primarily oil, the hydrophobic end is much bigger than the hydrophilic end in most cases. Again, if you did a 100% coconut oil soap, that's going to be pretty hydrophilic. It's going to love breaking down in water. It's going to dissolve faster, all of the things. So, but for the most part with a balanced, you know, batch of soaps, you're going to be dealing with more hydrophobic in your soap than hydrophilic. When you add sugar, you're dealing with more hydrophilic than hydrophobic. So sugar likes water. It will dissolve quickly in water. It will release its awesomeness and combine with the water and create bubbles. So for a soap that is like 100% olive oil, for example, which is very much going to be a hydrophobic soap for sure. That's why you don't have a lather at all. Doing something like adding a sugar to it increases that lather really quickly, really easily. And because, again, these sugar molecules are all sort of trapped around the saponification process and inside the saponification process, kind of like a honeycomb, right? And so when it hits water, those sugar molecules are opening up and allowing this transfer of energy between the water and the soap to be easier. And so you get bigger bubbles. It's pretty cool. So sugar is a really good addition to put into anything like probably the easiest one to really increase your lather and again i am going to for purposes of brevity and this video i'm going to go ahead and just lump beer into the sugar category as well because as far as the lather boost goes that's going to be the biggest benefit to using a beer is going to be the sugars that are in beer. And same with the purees. Purees can be a little bit difficult though. Again, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, but putting too much puree in can actually dampen that lather and make it not so fun. So, but purees in general, if used accordingly, yes, it's going to increase the lather as well. So there's an option to put into a recipe if you don't want to use copious amounts of your coconut, your babassu, or your palm kernel oils. Now, another additive to put into soap, which is again, easy to do and has a really big lather payoff would be using either aloe vera or soap nuts. 
Now, aloe vera, if you're using it in its liquid form, can actually be substituted for 100% of your water within a soap recipe for your lye solution, which we didn't talk about yesterday. And soap nuts can be used, uh, I mean, I personally take the little nuts and put them into the hot lye solution and then let the lye solution kind of suck it out like exothermic heat stuff, right? Or you can use the powdered version as well. Both aloe vera and soap nuts have a really big lather payoff because both are natural saponins. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you took your aloe plant, like just a piece of the plant or a soap nut and just ran them underwater, you're going to get natural bubbles and lather anyway. And so including that in your recipe, obviously a good way to boost the lather for the soap nuts, I don't know if we talked about them yesterday in yesterday's video, but we definitely talked about them, have done so a number of times on the channel in the past. So for the soap nuts, I would put like a couple nuts into a, you know, standard three pound batch of soap, the lye mixture, and let the lye cool down. Your mixture is going to be very dark. Or for the powdered version, uh, one tablespoon per pound of oil is usually the norm. I think two tablespoons works way better. So there's that. Now, another way to really increase lather with an easy additive is using clays. And yeah, there are different types of clays that you can use for this that will actually increase your lather. For example, bentonite clay, it is not the best thing to use if you're trying to increase lather. The reason for that is it really likes to draw all water to itself and it creates a creamier lather instead of like a good bubble payoff. So what you're looking for when you're using clays in your soap would be the more lighter weight clays. So the kaolins, the moroccans, your red clays, your pinks, all of the jazz, anything that has too much of a water, you know, soak up ability rating, real word, you don't want to use if what you're looking for is a big bubble. Activated charcoal also does increase the lather. Now, the reason that clays do increase the lather, because this is a really weirdly debated subject and, you know, whatever, but the reason why it does increase lather, well, a couple reasons. One is you're creating more friction within the bar, right? Because even if the clay is very, very lightweight, very, very powdery, it is still creating a friction piece because that is not going through saponification. The clays themselves are not going through saponification. Remember, we know what saponification is and clays do not have that chemical makeup to actually be consumed during the course of making soap. So again, this is something that gets trapped inside and around like a honeycomb the saponification and the new compound that is formed, which is soap, a salt. And so you are still creating a friction piece within all of that, even though the end user might not feel an exfoliation. It's gentle, it's light, it's small. Another reason really is also just the molecular structure of clay and what that is. When you start looking at clays and their chemical formulations, again, the lighter weight clays, they look a lot like sugar, but then you look at like bentonite, it loves water. That's why it soaks up so much of it. So you have to find the nice balance when you're working with clays because if you have one that's that loves water too terribly much, again, what you're going to ultimately end up with is a soap that has a creamy lather instead of a big, beautiful bubble. So the lightweight clays, they work really well in order to you know boost lather and do the things. And that's another awesome addition for all soap recipes. Again, if you don't wanna go down to your base oils and play with it there. Another thing to really keep in mind when you are trying to create a big, beautiful, awesome lather in a soap recipe is your super fat. Because if you have too high of a super fat, your lather, even if your recipe is completely dialed in and beautiful and you're happy with the conditioning and the cleansing and all of the numbers, and you have an appropriate percentage of your like coconut, babassu, or palm kernel oils in the recipe to ensure a big bubble, if the super fat is too high, doesn't matter. You already have too many free flowing oils hanging out in that recipe that were not consumed by the lye that was in it, that it's still going to lead to a creamier or a very scant lather or no lather at all, depending on how high that super fat is. How high is too high? Uh, that honestly depends on the recipe. Like we have done 
coconut oil with a 20% super fat, coconut oil with a 0% super fat. It really depends on the oils that are going in, but I think a good rule of thumb if you're dealing with like a balanced oil recipe, so three, no more than four oils in a recipe and reasonably equal parts for the majority of them, and maybe, you know, five to eight percent of a specialty oil within a recipe, I would say eight percent would be the highest that I would go for a super fat if you wanted to ensure that you still had a big beautiful bubble. And so for something like a 100% olive oil soap, that's an interesting one in and of itself because realistically an olive oil soap doesn't even need a super fat. There's not going to be a big benefit from doing so. I do recommend that all new soapers soap their recipes at 3% super fat no matter what just in case your measurements are a little bit off for your lie just in case your scale is off just in case so you have a little bit of extra oil to work with within your recipe but as you get more advanced and you're very confident with your measuring skills and all of your maths and everything yeah going down to a zero percent super fat for an olive oil would totally work if you add too much of a super fat within an olive oil soap, it's really going to make that lather worse and worse. And olive oil soaps already start out bad. So definitely pay attention to your super fat. And if you find a soap is not bubbling the way that you expected it to, try decreasing the super fat next time or look at that and see if maybe that's what's at play. Because there are also a number of oils if used in too high of amounts. I think jojoba is coming to mind right off the bat that while it can stabilize the lather, it can aid in stabilizing the lather, if you're using too much of it in your recipe, it can, you know, lead to a scant lather. And so we don't want that for sure. So pay attention to your super fats too when you're formulating your recipes if you want to make sure you have that big bubble. So let's say that you've done all of this. You have formulated a good big bubble recipe using, you know, your base oils and you have, let's say, 40% coconut oil in your recipe, which should be a pretty good bubble right off the bat. And let's say you also added a sugar, which is also increasing that awesome lather. And let's say you also, for good measure, put in some soap nuts, cool, you have some clay in there, awesome, and your super fat is sitting around 5%. Okay, that should be a guaranteed big bubble. It should have a good payoff in the hand right away. What if it doesn't? Well. Do you have hard water where you exist? Does your end user? Hard water, because of all of the minerals that exist within water that would make it hard by definition, uh, that can really damage how beautiful the lather is, for sure. And so looking at things like citric acid or sodium lactate and adding those to the bar definitely helps out with hard water and helps keep that lather nice, big, and bubbly and beautiful exactly where it should be. So we did talk about citric acid yesterday and sodium lactate a little bit to that. I wasn't meaning to, but I did so. And so both in appropriate usage rate can be great for boosting the lather as well as for ensuring that those hard water problems are not going to exist in your finished soap product. So definitely if you're playing with recipes and you find that the cases, this recipe says it should be bubbly and it's not, look to the water that it's being used in and see what we can do as far as adding a little bit of citric acid to the recipe or some sodium lactate to, you know, kind of fix and help that problem with the uh, hard water. Finally, another thing to really keep in mind if you are on the quest for the big bubble chase and you are having problems with that, look at the amount of butters you're putting into your soaps. We have done the shea butter soap 100% shea, right? And cocoa butter, 100% cocoa butter soap is coming up. And if you have too many butters just because of the high amounts of like stearic acid and whatnot in them, uh, you are going to end up with a bar that while it might be very creamy and luxurious and skin loving, it really can hinder the lather and the bar's overall performance in the hand. So keep that in mind. If you're having issues with your lather and you would like to increase it, try decreasing your butters too. I would say realistically for most cases, unless you're making a really specialty bar, no more than 10% butter if you really want to continue off with that big lather payoff. If that's not what you're going for in your soap though, yeah, you can totally increase those butters by a lot 
to get some other benefits like moisture and skin plumping and all the things that we just talk about here, but we can't super duper talk about with our customers. So wrapping this all up, what does it all mean? Well, as far as the great bubble chase, we're always on it, always. And the way that we find it really is as individual as we all are as soap makers. And so I can give you some tips and some tricks and some recipes and some ideas they may not work for you. They may not be what you want in a bar. They, you may not want to use coconut oil. You may not. So it really is a lot of playing and experimentation. But ultimately, when you are looking at how a lather is supposed to go chemically, you got to go down to what we always go down to the very basics of soap making, which is the fatty acid profiles and how all of these things come together molecularly. Everything that you put into a soap has a different molecular structure. And that means something. It means something when we consume sugar to our body, when we consume a carb. So of course it means something in the chemical reaction when you're making a soap. So pay attention to those sorts of things. And when you are having problems with your recipes, yeah, look to the fatty acid profiles first. And also make sure that you have a nice balance between your, your water loving and your water fearing molecules and your soaps and your additives and all the things. And that's going to set you on the right path. For funsies, because I was asked this question in relation to a Castile soap, that's kind of why I used it as a reference for the whole video. Try a Castile soap, a 100% olive oil soap with a 3% super fat using aloe vera or beer, sugar water, in place of your water. Then go ahead and add a soap nut or a couple tablespoons of soap nut powder to it and let me know how that goes. That would actually be a pretty amazing way to create a beautiful Castile soap, which I'm pretty sure we did do in year one. I think we did a 100% olive oil soap with aloe vera as the substitute. I don't know that we put sugar in it though but that was a really good lather. So yeah, probably gonna get a pretty decent lather considering Castile soaps have no lather. So that one might actually surprise you. But yeah, the great bubble chase, we're always on it. And I hope that I helped you guys out and maybe help troubleshoot some things today with what your recipes are doing or what you can look at for your next recipe if you're not super in love with the bubble that you're getting right now. I personally think that you should always start with the base oils and then the additives should be literally just that, an extra little addition to make your soap even more kick-ass. Start with your base oils because that's really where you're going to always build a kick-ass recipe for sure. I'm actually out of here for today. I'm going to go hang out with the Soap and Clay Kidlets. It's been fun having them on break and I want to go and continue, you know, hanging out and coloring and doing all the fun stuff that we've been doing. So... I really do appreciate you guys joining me today for, you know, all of this soapy journey fun, madness stuff. Super twitchy today. I know I've had lots of coffee, but I'm going to go not drink coffee. Maybe have some water. Everybody drink your water. Be good to your fellow humans. Enjoy the season. All of the jazz. I don't know why I'm talking to you like I'm signing off for a long period of time because, you know, this is daily content around here, so I will see you all tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. Bye. So twitchy.